So today's going to be hopefully another short lecture because I'm going to run out of material and I haven't updated the notes yet. So this is necessarily a short lecture. Um, depends on how long I can drag it out, but there's not going to be too much content, which is good. I mean, we all need, we're all tired. We all need a bit of a break. So this is all right. I don't think I'm going to get any complaints. This lecture is going to start with the proof of Kahan Kinchin. which has been our goal for a little while, at least two lectures. So just to remind us what the kahan kinchin theorem is, in case we've forgotten, for all p and q greater than one, uh, I won't quantify everything. It's a statement about Rademacher averages. I'm not gonna write it out this way. I'll write it out as an LP norm. When you take a Rademacher average in LP. So of course, this is a Rademacher sequence. Let's say Rad sequence or Rad sequence. This is a sequence of vectors in the Banach space, of course. Then up to constants that you don't care about, it doesn't matter whether you take LP or LQ. So we have the same Rademacher sum in here but now it's an LQ norm. And I hope everybody is, is now comfortable with this notation of squiggle equals, there's constant, this is less than or equal to C times the right-hand side. And in the other direction, there is also right-hand side less than or equal to some constant times the left-hand side. The constants depend on P and Q. Um, if P equals Q, of course, the constant is one. <laughs> and as P and Q, or as one of the P or Q approaches infinity, this constant will will blow up to infinity and you don't have the estimate at infinity. So it's important that we don't include this endpoint here. And I've been saying we're going to prove this from the your Nuremberg inequality and indeed we are. Actually all of the content of this proof is just the, the reduction down to your Nuremberg then we're done. So let's start. Someone needs to mute themselves. Who's not muted? Everybody mute yourselves. Okay, so we consider the filtration. We call it A, the filtration generated by the Rada marker sequence. Because to apply your Nuremberg, we need to have a filtration and a stochastic process lying around. So consider that filtration. And we also consider the, the A adapted sequence or process. F dot defined as follows. We take Fn to be one of two things. We take it to be either the sum from J from zero to N so this partial Rademacher sum, this is if N is less than or equal to capital N. I have a capital N, I didn't quantify over it, but I'm taking finite Rademacher sums. I'm taking them up to index capital N. Of course, the estimate doesn't depend on capital N. That's the whole point of this thing. So when small N is less than or equal to big N, I take the sum up to N. And if small N is greater than big N, I take the sum up to big N. That makes sense. So I take the partial Rada marker sums until there's nothing left. And then I just take a constant sequence from then on. I could do this, this whole argument for infinite Rada marker sums, but it's just a little bit technically easier to do it for finite ones. So we cap, out, we cap it off at capital N. Now we will show that for all Q, that the, the Rademacher average we care about, so the LQ Rademacher average is actually equal to this Q oscillation that we defined for the Jon Nuremberg inequality of this process. And at that point, once we have this, 
your Nirenberg will imply the result because what your Nirenberg says is that the Q oscillation is equivalent to the P oscillation. And if we can identify that oscillation with the Rademacher average for each Q and each P, just changing the letter, then we're done. That's what we want to do. So basically we just need to show this. Yeah. So since we've probably forgotten the exact form of what this oscillation is, I'll write it out. Remember it's the supremum over K less than or equal to N. So the supremum over both K and N. The supremum of sets A in the filtration in the sigma algebra AK with positive probability, positive measure. And we take the suprema of the average of Fn minus Fk minus one in LQ. Just, yep, remember that. So let's fix some parameters. Let's fix K and let's fix N and let's take them both to be less than capital N. Let's fix a set A in AK plus. Actually, uh, the way we've defined AK, AK is the, the sigma algebra generated by the first K Rademacher variables or the first K minus one Rademacher variables. And this is an atomic filtration because all of these functions are just nice, simple functions, the Rademacher functions. So actually every set in the sigma algebra, except for empty sets has, okay, I won't say that. I was gonna say every set has positive probability, but that's not true, you have the empty set. So let's say AK plus. <laughs> Other than the empty set, every set in the sigma algebra has got positive probability. Is that true or am I lying? It doesn't really matter, even if I am. Yeah, I think this is true, whatever. Let's compute the average that appears in the oscillation. So what we're doing, we're not really showing that the Rademacher average is equal to the oscillation. We're showing that the oscillation is equal to the Rademacher average. Think of it that way. Let's compute this. By definition, I'm going to move this to the other side of the screen. This is, so you divide by the probability of A and you take the integral over A. Let's write this as an expectation to be a bit more probabilistic. Expectation of the characteristic function of A because we're only integrating over A times the norm of this difference. Now Fn is the Rademacher sum up to n and fk minus one is the Rademacher sum up to k minus one. So you take a large partial sum minus a small partial sum, that's another partial sum. It's the sum from j equals k up to n. So this partial Rademacher sum like that. Now how do we compute this? What can we do with this? going to do a little bit of a trick for all omega in the probability space on which all of these Rademacher variables live. We look at this, this partial Rademacher sum, but we keep the omega in there. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll pull out the first one. We'll pull the first one out of the sum and then compensate. So we'll take out epsilon sub k, the first Rademacher variable. And then we'll write xk, the first term of the sum, plus the remaining terms of the sum. Now we have to take epsilon k, epsilon j, because the Rademacher variables are plus minus one valued. So if you take epsilon k times epsilon k, you get one, yeah? So this works out. Oops. 
And we're going to call this product of Rada Marker variables. We're going to call this epsilon j prime. Actually, I'm going to need to define that for all j. Let me do that explicitly. Epsilon j prime will be either epsilon j, if j is less than or equal to k, or it will be epsilon k times epsilon j for j greater than k. Let's define that. Uh, I forgot, I got one more line. We move from here. We're taking a norm of a plus minus one valued function times something and multiplying a vector by plus or minus one certainly does not change its norm. So we can actually forget that epsilon k. Let's write that as epsilon j minus xj, like that. So now we have what looks like a, a partial Rademacher sum as before, but now one of the Rademacher variables is gone. So we've removed one, and this is going to be quite handy. So what do we do now? Let's consider a new sigma algebra. We will call it A prime subscript k plus one n. This will be the sigma algebra generated by the Rademacher variable. Oh, okay, I'm giving the game away here. The variables epsilon j minus, they are Rademacher variables. From j between k minus one and n. So that this function over here, this is gonna be measurable with respect to that sigma algebra because all of the, the random variables appearing in the expression are actually the ones that generate the sigma algebra, epsilon j minus. So what we need to use is that the sigma algebra we define a prime k plus one n is independent of the sigma algebra a sub k generated by the first writer marker variables epsilon one up to epsilon k. Uh, why is this true? If we take j between one and k, and we take j prime between k plus one and n, and if we look at the expectation of the product epsilon j, epsilon prime, j prime, so we look at expectations of products of random variables that generate these sigma algebras, to test independence of the sigma algebras, we just need to test independence of the random variables that generate them. And that just means if you integrate the product, it's the same as the product of the integrals. So when you write out what this expectation is, you get epsilon j, epsilon k, epsilon prime, j prime, because that's the definition of the epsilon primes. And this using the independence of the, oh, sorry, I don't have a prime there, that's just epsilon j prime, using that the original Rada marker sequence consists of independent random variables, I can say that if j is less than k, so that j prime is greater than k, these three Rada marker variables are all distinct. So we get the expectation of the first, the expectation of the second, expectation of the third by independence. And if j is equal to k, so that this ej ek is, no, is epsilon j epsilon j, you get the product of, you get one squared or minus one squared, so you get one. You simply get the expectation of epsilon j prime. And in either case, this is equal to zero because Rada marker variables have mean zero. So this tells you that these two sigma algebras the ones generated by these Rademacher variables are actually independent of each other. And what this will tell us is since our set A that we were working with is contained in the sigma algebra AK, and since this function here is a K plus one N prime measurable, 
we can do this. We can say that this expectation we needed to compute J. So remember, this is what we actually wanted to compute all along. We rewrite that Radamaka sum as before. We take out the first vector and we have a sum from k plus one up to n of epsilon j prime xj. So now, as I said before, this is in a sub k. This is a sub k plus one n prime measurable. And these sigma algebras are independent. So the expectation of the product is a product of the expectation. Uh, just one question. Yep. So, so you're saying that the, the a, that, that sigma algebra is independent of a k because uh, the, the the expectations uh, are zero of the products. Yeah, because AK is generated by, let me write it out a bit more explicitly. AK is the sigma algebra generated by epsilon zero, epsilon one, up to epsilon K. Okay. And this AK plus one N is generated by these epsilon primes. And if I yeah. take one of the generators of the first and one of the generators of the second, and I take the expectation of the product, you see that it is yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's I zero, which is equal to the product of the expectation, <laughs> which I should have said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm just, yeah, okay. I'll... So you have the independence property for all of the functions that generate the sigma algebra, and this is enough to imply that the sigma algebras themselves are independent. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Or it's enough to imply that for all functions that are measurable with respect to those sigma algebras, those functions are independent. But Shouldn't we have to show this for all functions and not just for some generating functions? I mean, if we had just had to show it for one function and we could just change one value of this function and by the intermediate value theorem, the expectation value would have zero, hit zero at some point, probably. Uh, the, the point isn't that the expectation is zero, but that the expectation is the product ah. of the expectations. <laughs> right. Took okay. a bit of a shortcut Yeah. That's okay. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, yeah. I'm fine with that. <laughs> um, what I was thinking unless I've messed it up somehow, it should be enough yeah. to check this independence property for the generators of the sigma algebras. I mean, what I was doing was I thought you were showing uncorrelatedness of the random variables. So uh, I don't like know. Yeah, zero, but that doesn't imply independence. But no, but in this in this case, we have mean zero yeah. things. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I've taken a bit of a mental shortcut here and I've said this is equal to zero, that should do. That's not what we actually need to prove. We need to prove that this expectation is equal to this yeah. product of expectations. Yeah. That's We can take the shortcut here because the expectations are zero. Yeah, my, my uh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, no, this is a little bit confusing. I accept that. So let's continue down here. All right, where were we? Right, so we use independence, this confusing property of independence of these two sigma algebras to, to write this expectation as a product. Uh, this term here is actually just equal to one because the expectation of the characteristic function of A is the probability of A. And this term here, we do the exact same argument we did before and put the Rada markers back. So now we say sum from J from k to n, epsilon j, xj. So what that whole argument was about doing, <laughs> we have this expectation here we want to estimate. And what it does is it says, okay, you can forget the a and you can forget the probability. This is a little independence argument to say that basically what's happening is the distribution of this Rada marker average is the same on every a in the sigma algebra ak. But to use the independence argument you need, you have to actually make this function here independent of AK. And in the form that it's written, it doesn't seem to be because you have the variable epsilon K sitting around, but you can actually show that you can pull that out, that you can get rid of it. It doesn't actually contribute to the norm. 
you can always pull out one of the router market variables and get an independent, uh, an equally distributed but different router marker sequence that you can work with. It's a nice little argument. So this is going to help us quite a bit in writing out what this oscillation is because the oscillation is a supremum over A and we've just eliminated A. <laughs> Great. So just to, to write out a bit more explicitly what we've proven, this integral over A, this average over A, uh, not PQ, that appears in our oscillation is the expectation of the Rutter marker sum from J equals K up to N. So not the full Rutter marker average here, just the, the average where you start at the kth Rutter marker variable. This was for A in AK, of course. Right, what do we do next? So we're going to need to take a supremum over, over all A and over all K and N and so on. So we need to think what's this supremum going to be? Let's consider a sigma algebra again, A, K, N. We're going to define it like before, but now we don't need these modified Rader marker variables. We just use the ones we started with. Sigma algebra generated by epsilon j, j between k and n. We see that the Rader marker average starting from k is, how do I want to write this expectation? We take the norm in X, we don't change any of that. This function on the inside is actually measurable with respect to that sigma algebra. Oh, actually what we're going to do, we're not saying that. It's the, the conditional expectation with respect to this sigma algebra of the full Rader marker sum. Do people believe that? Like you take the full Rader marker sum with all of the Rader marker variables. And if you take the sigma algebra generated by just a subset of those, the conditional expectation is going to give you the partial sum just on that set. I realize now that I probably should have proven that explicitly. This is something that to me was obvious. <laughs> Maybe it's not completely obvious. This follows from the independence of the Rader marker variables, if you want to prove it explicitly. And maybe let's call that an exercise if you want to prove that explicitly. But at this point, I feel that's obvious. Maybe it's not. Is anybody really convinced this is not obvious? I think if I have to ask, it's not obvious. <laughs> okay, it's not obvious. I mean, have I, a think I, about it. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure if I write it out, it'd be pretty straightforward, but we'll see. The way you would prove it is you use the, the definition of what a conditional expectation is. If you integrate over a set, which is in that sigma algebra, the integral should be the same as the integral of the original function over that same set. And then you just use that the sigma algebra is generated by a certain subset of the Rader marker variables and you use the independence to take out the, the bits that don't matter somehow. It'll make more sense if you write it down, but it, it won't be exceptionally difficult. Maybe you can prove it by induction or something. I don't know. But anyway, this is true. And the reason we want to know that is because conditional expectations have this non-expansive property in LQ. So this will be less than or equal to the expectation of the full Rutter marker sum, just taking out the conditional expectation here. And more importantly, you will have a quality when K is zero and N is capital N. Of course, in that case, you have equality because then you're looking at the conditional expectation of the full sigma algebra, of the full Rader marker sum on the full sigma algebra and nothing happens because the function is already measurable with respect to that full sigma algebra. So, 
So what does this let us do? We are pretty much done. Let's look at this oscillation. So supremum over k less than or equal to n, a and a k plus of the average that we computed. which is equal to the supremum over, what can I get rid of? Still k less than or equal to n. We have a supremum over a, but we saw that this average doesn't depend on a, so we don't have to write the supremum in a. We just write out the writer marker sum. J goes from k to n. Like so. And here we know that the supremum but we know that this is less than or equal to this full Rademacher average. And you do have equality when k is zero and n is n. So the supremum occurs when k equals zero and n is n, or the maximum in this case, it's not even a supremum. And that was what we needed to prove, right? The Rademacher average in LQ is given by this particular LQ oscillation. And by your Nuremberg, this LQ oscillation is equivalent to the LP oscillation. And the LP oscillation is the LP Rademacher average. So that tells you that the LP Rademacher average and the LQ Rademacher average are equivalent. And that's it. Very good. I'm gonna just emphasize what these theorems are because they really are the fundamental theorems here. So let me just write it out like this. Fundamental theorems of Rider marker averages. Nobody actually calls them that, but they probably should. The contraction principle, also by Kahan. In case you've forgotten what that is, it says that if you take a Rader marker average and you put coefficients in it, let's do it in LQ, doesn't matter which Q we do it in, then this is controlled by the Rader marker average without coefficients. And I need to put in a maximum term. Yeah, like that. The AJs have to be scalars. And yeah, this, this is true with it with an implicit constant that constants less than or equal to two. If the scalars are real, the constant is one. If the scalars are complex, the optimum one's pi on two, but we don't know the proof. So the two fundamental theorems are the, the contraction principle and the kahan kinchin that we just proved. I'll write it out one last time because it's so important. Rider marker averages don't depend on the exponent you take as long as it's less than infinity. I should say the same thing here. Okay, all good. I should point out, we only proved the contraction principle for Q equals one, but it follows from Gahan Kinchin that it follows for all Q, but actually the argument that we did for Q equals one works independently well for all Q. So you don't have to worry about swapping Q to one, invoking the theorem for Q equals one, and then putting it back to Q. You pay the price of a couple of constants if you do that. And we don't care about constants, but just so you know, you don't need to, to do that. Okay, that's all that for Kahan Kinchin. That's all of the Jan Nuremberg we'll need. I don't think we're gonna need it again in the course. We really just needed it for, for this. It's so important that we had to do the full tedious proof. But yeah, are there any questions? Well, since this is a short lecture, I have another 
section after this. It's on Rademacher spaces. We can sort of, this would be a logical point for a break. We may as well just have the early break and then do the second part after the break. Everyone happy with that? Yep, can you give me a thumbs up? Good, let's do that.